Hey, everybody. This is Tony Blank, <coughs> Director of Startup Programs at Agora, and we are here for the Infrastructure and Security Track at API Days. And we have a great talk coming up here for our first track. We have Johan Nalanthambi from the Head of Solutions Architecture at WSO2, who's going to uh, give us a great talk on the evolution of API security for clients and applications. How are you doing today, Johan? I'm good. Thank you. How are you, Tony? I'm doing fantastic. And uh, where are you based out of? I'm based out of Palermo, Sri Lanka. So it's quite late ah. here. <laughs> Oh, that's that, that's amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, late at night, your time, and I'm excited to to uh, see see your talk. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Well, uh, are you all set? Yes, I'm all set. All right. Fantastic. All right. So, hi everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Johan Nalakambi. Um, I'm the Head of Solutions Architecture for IEM at WSO2. So my talk for today is uh, the evolution of API security for client-side applications. So um, client-side applications are becoming uh, an increasingly popular um, technology to build applications going to their superior user experience. However, developers have a hard time getting their heads around authentication and API authorization for client-side applications. Uh, in this session, I will attempt to demystify some of the complexities and misconceptions surrounding this topic. At the end of this session, I've also posted some references to detailed articles I've written on this topic. So I encourage you all to have a look at them. They are discussing even more patterns in this session today. So client-side applications are referred to as OAuth through public clients in uh, the OAuth 2 specification. So there are two main key uh, concerns when it comes to OAuth 2 public clients. One is that OAuth 2 public clients cannot store their client secrets securely on the client side storage, and they cannot store access tokens and refresh tokens securely in the client side storage. Uh, in browser applications, the client secret and access tokens have to be stored in the browser storage. Whereas in mobile native applications, they are stored in device memory. Both of these storages cannot be considered entirely secure as they are outside the control perimeter of the application. So let's look at um, how um, uh, the, the client-side application security landscape has evolved over the years. So in its evolution, we see two kinds of user experiences for client-side applications. The back-channel API experience and the front-channel redirect experience. If your client-side application is built to support only username password authentication, then the back-channel API experience may work just fine for most users, especially if your application is a first-party application. Uh, they also provide a superior user experience. Uh, however, if the application needs to support identity federation with an IDP in order to enable multi-factor authentication, social login, etc., then you may have to go for a functional redirect-based uh, approach. So the first pattern that we are going to look at today is the legacy back-channel client. So in this pattern, uh, there are two components, the client-side application, you can imagine of a, a JavaScript application, and there is the HTTP server component. So the client-side application is going to invoke an authentication API using the username password. The HTTP server is going to respond with uh, the user. Uh, I mean, if the username password is successful, it will return uh, the user information and an API token. The API token is going to be stored on the client-side application in the browser storage, and then subsequently used for API calls. So very simple pattern. Now, this pattern evolved into what I call the OIDC-like resource uh, owner password grant client. Why I call this OIDC-like is because OIDC doesn't really have a resource owner password grant, but uh, many vendors support this kind of a flow because it resembles uh, the OAuth2 password grant. 
So the key difference in this uh, pattern compared to the previous one is that we have a the, the backend server has been now split into two components: the standard IAM component with OAuth two capability and the uh, API server, which is going to host the APIs. Uh, so the client side application is going to interact with the IAM component using standard OAuth two like flow and then use the access token to invoke the backend API. So that's the main difference between the two patterns. So what are the advantages in the back channel flows? The main advantages, uh, advantage in the back channel flow is that there is no hindrance to the user experience due to redirections, right? Uh, but the main disadvantages is that there is no standard single sign-on experience uh, across these applications mostly, uh, unless there is some proprietary implementation that is supported as well as uh, user passwords are um, handled or given to uh, the client side application, which probably could be a third party application, uh, which might be not the best thing to do. Right? So that's the main two main disadvantages. So then we come to the legacy front channel client flows, right? So this is mainly used when you want something beyond username password authentication, right? When you want multi-factor authentication, when you want social login, so in this case, uh, think of a JS application, JavaScript application, which is going to redirect you to the HTTP server. In the HTTP server, the user will perform whatever authentication that is supported. And then on successful login, the HTTP server is going to redirect you back to the JavaScript application with a correlation handle. The correlation handle is a reference identifier for the successful authentication. The JavaScript application is going to send this correlation handle to the HTTP server and load the single page application again. Uh, while this application is loading, you would also get the session data and the API token. The API token, as usual, is going to be stored in the client side and is going to be used for API invocations. So the API token in this case is primarily going to be, uh, is, is typically stored in cookies. Right, so cookies are automatically sent with uh, API calls, so the application doesn't have to manually handle these cookies if they are automatically sent. As well as to load the session data uh, after the authentication, either you could uh, load it uh, in the HTML DOM or it can be a dedicated API uh, which is also protected with the cookie. This pattern evolved into the implicit grant flow in OAuth 2 for the same reasons I mentioned uh, in the back channel API flows. Basically, it decouples the IEM component from the API component for performing standard OAuth 2 based uh, login to the client side application. So that's the main reason why we have the, uh, in, uh, why uh, we evolved into an uh, OAuth 2 flow. So at this point, I want to draw your attention to two key security properties when it comes to client-side applications. That is, client-side applications uh, should not uh, obtain client secrets unless uh, you are going to issue unique secrets for each installation of the client-side application. Right? And also another very important property is that the redirect URIs must be registered and verified against each authorization request. So what are the pros and the cons of implicit flow? The main advantage in the implicit flow is that it has only one round trip, so you get the token faster. And also because the token is part of the fragment URI, it doesn't reach the backend server components. There's a list of disadvantages because uh, the token is part of the fragment URI. It's visible in the URL address bar. It's stored in browser history. It can be synced to other devices. It can be fetched by unverified JavaScript browser extensions. It can be logged in proxy servers and disclosed through referral headers. Uh, it is susceptible to interception attacks. And most importantly, uh, it can be viewed, uh, the access token and the refresh token can be visible in the client side storage. And also there is no refresh token uh, returned in this flow. So implicit flow was mainly uh, invented due to a limitation in the browsers at the time. So at the time, browsers could not do cross-origin resource sharing. So that was the main reason why they had to go with implicit flow, uh, why they couldn't use authorization code flow. But over time, uh, this uh, limitation went away and browsers could do cross-origin resource sharing. As well as uh, more recently, the 
advent of PKCE meant that code interception attacks have been mitigated. So with these two improvements, the significance of uh, implicit ground flow has been uh, drastically reduced and authorization port flow became the uh, de facto standard even for client-side applications. So the advantages of authorization port flow is that it uh, negated all the disadvantages that we previously saw in implicit port flow except for uh, we are going to store the access token and refresh token. So that's the problem we still need to handle, which we'll talk through this presentation. Also, it introduces a short-lived one-time use code, uh, which reduces the attack surface. Also, it issues a refresh token, which means uh, the user has to interact less frequently with the IDP to obtain new tokens. The main advantage in the front channel flows are that uh, it provides you single sign-on experience with OpenID Connect. And also uh, the passwords are only, the user passwords are only given to the uh, trusted IAM system. Uh, the disadvantage, however, is that you have redirections which may hinder user experience. However, even that particular disadvantage of user experience, uh, of redirections rather, uh, can be reduced uh, with modern development practices. Uh, so today, when you look at uh, many JavaScript applications, uh, instead of doing a complete browser redirect, what they usually do is they pop up a child window or what we call models and do a redirect within the child window uh, by having the parent window in the background. So this provides a much better user experience than the full redirect approach. Also in mobile devices, the refresh tokens are stored in memory uh, uh, encrypted. Uh, so uh, the keychain is basically used to encrypt and uh, also the face ID or touch ID is used uh, to decrypt the uh, tokens and retrieve it back into memory. So therefore uh, the refresh tokens can be stored for a longer period of time which means that uh, the user has to interact less frequently uh, in order to log in. And as fallback options uh, usually we provide things like SMS OTP. So the, the, you can see the security and the user experience is balanced well. So the, 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 the problem that still remains at hand is how are we going to store these tokens securely? So cookies have a very interesting property. Uh, so in, uh, in uh, browsers, there are two main storages, HTML5 and cookies. Uh, compared to HTML5, cookies have some interesting properties. So an HTTP only cookie has built in protection against cross-site scripting. As well as if the cookie is a secure cookie, it cannot be transported uh, over a non-secure channel. And also it supports course cross-origin resource sharing. Though it has a CSRF vulnerability, it can be mitigated by patterns like synchronization token and double submit cookie. So the conclusion is that cookies are preferred over HTML5 web storage with enough CS CSRF protection ensured. So based on these properties of the cookies, what are the different patterns that we can use to store uh, tokens securely? So I mainly categorize them into non-standard and standard patterns. Uh, so the non-standard patterns, there are two types, uh, one based on client-side proxies and the other based on server constraint tokens, server-side implementations. So the first pattern that we are going to look at is what I call stateless OAuth2 plus API client proxy. So in this pattern, we are introducing a client-side proxy component in the middle, uh, which is going to proxy the authorization code request as well as the API calls. What it's going to do is when the authorization, uh, uh, when the when the token response uh, returns from the OAuth2 server, it is going to uh, basically take the access token and the refresh token values encrypt those values and store it in a secure cookie against its domain, the proxy domain, and set it to the browser. When the single page application does an API call to the proxy, the cookies are sent along with the API call because it belongs to the same domain. The cookies, uh, the values are decrypted at the proxy and then it, the values, the access token is used to do the API call. In case the access token is expired, the proxy will handle the refresh flow as well. So this is a stateless OAuth2 API client proxy. So the advantage in this flow is that uh, the plain text tokens cannot be obtained at the client side. 
uh, and uh, it cannot uh, you cannot use it by bypassing the proxy but still it is vulnerable to csrf so if 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 you exploit a csrf vulnerability you can still make use of the token uh, in its encrypted form through the proxy itself so the other disadvantage is that it's not a pure single page application architecture so in order to mitigate that we have another pattern which is a, a, a server side implementation uh, which we call the split token pattern so this pattern is inspired by the double submit cookie and it mitigates the uh, csrf vulnerability what happens here is the the reverse proxy component when it uh, receives the uh, token response from the OAuth to server uh, in step number two, it splits the tokens. It splits the access token and refresh token, and it uh, puts the uh, part of the access token and refresh token in the um, in the token response to the client, and part of the access token and the refresh token is stored in a secure HTTP only cookie, and uh, when the single page application makes the API call, both the cookie value as well as the uh, Biara token uh, in the authorization header comes to the reverse proxy. The reverse proxy concatenates the two and makes the API call. So this, if you are familiar with double submit cookie, this is something inspired by that which mitigates CSRF. So what is the best way to split the tokens? Well. If we mostly use J, we mostly use JWT tokens, so in JWT the header and payload part may contain useful information for the client side application to uh, use for uh, authorization. So therefore, that could be part of the Biara, uh, rather the token response, which could be read by the uh, client side application. Whereas the signature may be put into the cookie, which is kind of uh, not used by the single page application. The more recent uh, uh, pattern that we see is web workers. So in web workers, basically, um, you have uh, uh, in 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 web workers basically uh, web workers can run JavaScript code in a background thread separate from the main execution thread. Uh, they communicate with the front-end application via a channel called message channel. Specifically, the application can send a message to the web worker to perform some action. The web worker will perform the action and send back to the application the needed information. The secret never leaves the memory of the web worker. So that's the important point. Uh, then there are some standard uh, sender constraint token patterns. We have uh, the token binding, which was in, uh, introduced some time back, but it suffered an important setback when major browser vendors uh, dropped its support. Uh, we then had the walk to mutual PLS client authentication and certificate bound access tokens. This one also had some issues and uh, further uh, details needed to be ironed out before you know adopting it uh, in a practical world. Uh, the most recent one we have is the OAuth 2 demonstration of proof of possession at the application layer. Uh, this uh, regulation uh, standard seems to be very promising. It has gone through several iterations. Basically, what it does is it uh, ensures that the client who is obtaining the OAuth 2 access token is the same client that is using the access token to invoke business API. So basically, it binds the uh, token, uh, the caller of the token request to the caller of the API call. Also, um, uh, most of the security patterns for client-side token storage discussed uh, so far um, are not mainstream yet. Uh, if none of the patterns could be implemented, and also if uh, long-lived refresh tokens are discouraged by your security teams, which might be the case mostly, uh, you don't have to worry. There is a, a workaround for that. So the sliding sessions, how it works is basically we make use of the logged in session in the authorization server which supports OpenID Connect. And the sing all the single page applications can periodically send uh, a request to the uh, authorization server uh, through a hidden iframe. So since it's made through a hidden iframe, uh, you don't, uh, the user experience is not disrupted. The request that we make is an authorization request with prompt none. And um, that basically, uh, gives back either an authorization code or a, a error message. So based on whether you get an authorization code or error message, 
uh, the the uh, the application can decide whether to uh, ref refresh the code uh, and renew the access token or explicitly log out and log in back again. Uh, we move on to mobile application security and there also we have had some interesting evolution. We started with WebViews, which is kind of an embedded browser. Uh, however, it was not a security sandbox. Uh, it, it, it is uh, the, the browser security sandbox is not applicable. JavaScript can call system APIs and there was no single sign-on experience. Uh, then we also had uh, NAPS, uh, which was uh, introduced by uh, OpenID Working Group. Uh, it provided single sign-on, it uh, managed tokens, but this was uh, eventually uh, dropped uh, due to the uh, advancements in uh, uh, native browsers in mobile applications. So the uh, standard today and the recommendation is to use RFC 8252, uh, which uses the system browser to do uh, redirections to the uh, identity provider. And also it is recommended to use app claimed HTTPS scheme redirect URIs. Also to use state parameter to mitigate CSRF uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and also uh, modern browsers provide uh, web controllers to make the user experience almost in on par to the um, uh, native application. So uh, iOS provides AS web authentication session and Google Chrome provides custom tabs. Uh, which are uh, which provide a much better user experience. So these are some references the, that uh, I can point you to. Uh, some articles. There are more patterns such as this have been discussed in detail. And closing remarks. Unfortunately, when it comes to uh, client side application security, uh, there is no bulletproof solution. Uh, you need to uh, mitigate the common types of attacks and you need to reduce the overall attack surface. Uh, the right solution depends on uh, how, in, how critical is your business application, how sensitive it is. Uh, and always try to move from uh, to a backend for frontend kind of pattern. Try to move your tokens towards backend, which is uh, probably the best thing to do. Um, thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much for sharing all of the uh, the history of API security for me. And uh, I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not anonymous anymore. I'm I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh, but the, that 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 was a great overview. Uh, fantastic. Um, of of all of the different kinds of uh, schemas uh, uh, and and different kinds of patterns and, and methods, uh, which one is your favorite one to to implement? So today, I think, um, I mean, over time, uh, people have been using many patterns, but I think today, most of uh, the vendors and uh, developers have standardized on the web worker pattern, uh, which is the kind of the easiest, and a lot of uh, vendors are providing SDKs to support this pattern. So I think today, uh, almost everyone is starting to adopt that pattern, but we still see implementations remaining, legacy implementations remaining, and have to be supported for the older kind of patterns as well. Right on, right on, right on. Uh, very, very cool. Well, I have to say, like, all of this talk about cookies is making me hungry. <laughs> right on. Well, uh, thank you uh, so much for a fantastic talk, and thank you again for uh, for staying up late. Uh, we have a, 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 a really good talk coming up here, uh, coming up from, uh, from Marco uh, on how to achieve zero trust security. So give us just a couple seconds to get everything all switched over and, uh, and we'll, we'll get the next talk queued up. But uh, again, thank you so much, Joanne, and I uh, uh, hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. You have a good one.